Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Christian Fellowship Church in New Glasgow. So glad you could join us. Uh, at the same time, we are actually having a, a group in the church that's experiencing a service uh, at the same time. This service that you're watching is pre-recorded, and so it's not the exact same message, but very close to it. And then uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we have a service at the church where the same message will be preached, and, but there will be worship and there will be a gathering, and you're welcome to come uh, to this. Um, the clip you just saw about heroes, people who are willing to lay down their lives, risk their lives for the safety of others as a result of this coronavirus pandemic. And we give thanks to God for them. People that will put their lives at great risk in order to help others. And we see that principle, of course, in the life of Jesus. And he died as a result. And of course, several in the healing professions have died as a result of this virus. And it's with great sadness that that is happening. And of course, all of, all of those who are dying because of the, the disease itself is, is also extremely tragic. And as we see the numbers of people and the growth in, uh, in numbers of people that are dying because of the virus around the world is, is um, very, very, very heartbreaking and causes us to uh, feel great empathy for those that are, have died and uh, what they went through and for their families that are left. Now, in the Bible, uh, we are faced with two realities when it comes to um, life itself and how people respond to crisis, how people respond to situations that are beyond their control. Um, now, I should say that if you decide to come to our church, we have, we have protocols that we follow. Uh, we ask that you wear a mask. That's extremely important, and uh, uh, personally, I'm very grateful to our Premier Stephen McNeil and our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Strang, for the way they've handled this pandemic and uh, how they've released churches to open up again, uh, at the same time providing guidance for everyone's safety. And uh, we live in a province where, as far as I know at this point, there's only one active case of the coronavirus uh, uh, disease, and uh, we're grateful to our premier and our chief medical officer for the way they've handled this. I'm, I'm personally very thankful to them, and uh, and uh, we we honor them for what for what they've done. So you can come, but there are protocols that we ask you to follow, and uh, one of them is wearing a mask. And we also can't sing. It's not that we can't; they're not prohibiting it, but they're saying there as a guideline for maximum protection for everyone. It's what they are urging us uh, to do. Well, two realities. And I'm going to express them by reading Psalm chapter 11, verse 1. Now, this psalm is seven verses in length, and I'll be referring to each verse in turn. And it says, In the Lord I take refuge. A powerful statement. In the Lord I take refuge. So he's referring to a, a, the fact that there is something for which he needs to find refuge from. And uh, life is full of those kinds of things. And then the next statement is, how then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? So one reality is that we can trust in God when there's a time for a need for refuge, when things are just too much for us to bear on our own, or there's things that are enigmatic, you just don't know where to turn. There doesn't seem to be an answer that works. And so it's, it's where do you go at a time like that? How do you deal with the stresses of life? And the first reality is that we can turn to the Lord. The second reality is that we can try to escape and he says, he says I, I put my faith in God, so how can you tell me, and it appears that there were people that were encouraging him, to run from the trial, to run from the pressure. And so he says, how can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? In other words, 
Your mountain is your place of refuge that is apart from God. It's, it's the place for you to go to whenever the trials of life are so great you can't handle them. Or just whenever you feel depressed or discouraged or as a result of isolation because of this pandemic, you just, well, you, you look to whatever source you typically look to. Uh, it can be an addiction. It can be alcohol. It can be just running and hiding away from people. It can become, you can become aggressive in, in, in the way you act uh, towards others, particularly in your own family. And we all have these places, these mountains, where we, and notice that the, the whole metaphor is about you fly to the mountain. So it's, it's like you get up there in a hurry. It's where we default to very quickly, very readily. But trusting in God, finding in him our refuge, is actually a state of mind. It's a state of emotions. Yes, it's spiritual for sure, but it manifests itself in how we think and how we feel. Are we discouraged, despondent? Are we stressed? Are our emotions feel all over the map? Are we up? Are we down? Uh, but when we find our refuge in Jesus, when we find our refuge in God, it stabilizes all aspects of our lives. And when you find your refuge in Jesus, when you find your refuge in Lord, in the in the Lord, uh, it's a defense against the trials of life that no mountain that you create to which you flee, no place where you may uh, design for on your own. Th there's nothing that compares. Nothing you can come up with yourself. Uh, it will come close to putting your trust in the Lord. The temptation is. That in a crisis that demands our responsibilities, that we, that there's something that we must do to act, the temptation is for us to run and flee and hide, and and uh, and shirk or remove ourselves from those responsibilities. So faith or fear, faith or your own devices, trusting God or trusting yourself or the mountain that you create. What about you when you get a, a, a diagnosis of, a, of a, a severe disease? What if it was even COVID-19? Do you trust in the Lord? When, what about whenever the weight of suffering becomes so great you can't bear it? Whenever there's something that's just so terribly wrong in your life circumstance and it just feels like you can't carry that load anymore? And for what about for Christians or for people that are really wanting to serve God and you, you're pressing in to, to grow spiritually, but then you find that you're not, that you're going backwards instead of forwards, uh, you can start to just abandon the whole quest. And uh, there's so many things. When it, what happens when our emotions uh, just become so negative and we start to lash out at people and... Uh, so, so it, we have a choice to find our refuge from those things in our trust in God, which will then change those things for us. When the responsibilities that we bear see, are bigger than we are, or they seem to be, you can just overwhelm us and you just capitulate under that load. But when you trust in the Lord, there's a, a divine strength and power that helps you to to come uh, above that. And verse 2, it, it says, For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. Now, the fact of the matter is, uh, the, the moment that you decide to do good, the moment you decide to do right, the moment you decide to put your trust in the Lord, there will always be those around you who will discourage you from that. Give up. You can't do it. You, you really think you can take on this challenge and win? You really think that God has given you a vision for something? that You're kidding yourself. It's a pipe dream. It's just not going to happen. So there's, there's always this attack, it seems. Sometimes the, the enemy is right within us, not necessarily those that are evil around us or trying to dissuade us from doing good. But from right within us, there can be that voices. It's run to the mountain, flee, go back to the bottle, go back to the state of whatever it is. 
that you've always fled to in order to escape the challenges that you face. In verse 3, it says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what will the righteous do? Well, the foundations that he's referring to are not the foundations of God. <laughs> They're immutable. They, they cannot be destroyed. And the Bible is so clear about that and, uh, uh, and so wonderfully clear about that, even in the, in the parable that Jesus told about the man who built his house on the sand versus the man who built his house upon the rock. And so the foundation of life, when it's built upon the Lord, is a sure foundation, and the scriptures teach that throughout. So the foundations that he's talking about are those things upon which our society rests, or the social order, if you will, the, just the way things are in the world these days. And often those things are systems, practices, beliefs, that are not rooted in trust in God, but are rooted in trust in man, that become that mountain, that place where there are two realities. And it challenges, um, it challenges us. We tem tend to, even as Christians, to go back to the foundations of the world, the principles upon life, upon which life pr is practiced in a world apart from God, or so often apart from God. So what will the righteous do? Well, the first thing is the righteous will trust in God, not in trust in the systems. We will not trust in fraud, fraud or dishonesty or error. Um, we will trust in the Lord. And what will we do? The question is, what can the righteous do? Well, that's what the righteous can do. Trust the Lord and not depend upon the failing systems of this world. Two very important things to state. There are no man-made solutions to spiritual problems. And at the foundation of all that this world goes through that is wrong, even sickness, there's a spiritual problem. And that problem is mankind's departure from God in the first instance when God created us and then throughout history since then. So there are no man-made answers to spiritual problems. And there are no political answers to spiritual problems. The only answer to spiritual problems is putting our trust in the Lord. And verse 4 is so beautiful. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. Well, uh, there is a place where God dwells. Now, he's... Now, this was written before Sol Solomon's temple was built. So he's not talking about Solomon's temple in the Old Testament. He's talking about the dwelling place of God. And he's talking about it as being a holy temple, a dwelling place. And he also talks about a heavenly throne, a source of authority and power that is not earthbound or of earthly origin. It's heavenly in nature. And it's from that stance that he looks upon your situation and mine and the situation of everyone in the world and he observes. He sees it. And his eyes examine them. Well, um, that's a powerful truth. It's a powerful thing. He sees you. He hears you. Uh, he knows you. He knows the stress and the strain or the besetting sin. He knows, he knows the things that are true about you. And he knows them in a different way than you see them. When it says he observes them, he sees things about you that undoubtedly you don't see yourself. He observes potentials and possibilities that you may think are just pipe dreams or just wishful thinking. But God sees you in a different way than you see yourself or Others see you. You can ascend to that place where God dwells. And you can ascend to that place of his kingdom authority, the authority of his person and his word, the authority of his son, the authority of Holy Spirit. These are absolutes. These are not the transient things that come and go in the world. This is a, a reality of, of most, that is most precious in nature. The holy temple of God. 
His holiness teaches us to fear sin and to avoid it. And he, he, his holiness causes us to value those things are right, that are righteous and good. The, the, that place where we find our trust in God. And his holiness ushers in the glory of God, the presence of God. And his holiness is a, a drawing power. It's, it's just so magnetic in its nature. It's just like once you've tasted it, once you've experienced it, nothing else will do. Uh, Kim Haney uh, wrote a book called Guarding the Channels of the Supernatural. Um, guarding the channels of the supernatural. And here's what she said. Uh, this is a quote. To be able to fellowship with the presence of God in the way that we do, to feel the divine touch of the master's hand upon us and upon our lives, to have a refuge, a fortress, to experience the power and demonstration of God himself Manifesting in our midst is worth more than any amount of money. Well, uh, very true. The presence of God. Sometimes uh, people will come to church, and there's a, there's a, a a powerful thing that happens when Christians gather. The New Testament is full of uh, of teaching on that, and uh, sometimes people come to church and. And they'll say afterwards, well, there was something very special about that meeting. Uh, there, there was just kind of a unexplainable dynamic to it. I, I, I found myself crying at times. I, I found myself so happy and joyful. I, I found myself lifted. I just, wow. And so people will come to after a church meeting, and, and they'll say, that was just precious. It was wonderful. And uh, especially folks that might come to church for the first time. And I often hear those kinds of things said uh, when that happens. Now, uh, you could chuck it up to, well, there was emotionalism. They, you know, they just were <laughs> caught up in the emotion and fed on, on each other's emotion. And, or it was the presence of God. It was actually the presence of the Holy Spirit who promised to be with us and that Jesus promised to send to us. And so uh, the presence of God for sure, uh, more than more than any amount of money in terms of worth, and and I I really think this is an important statement to make too. As our world gets darker, as the trials and the pressures that we see around the world, uh, as things get darker, um, the presence of God becomes even more precious more valuable to his people. And so we thank God for his holiness, for his presence in his temple. And the Bible says in the New Testament that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So there's a, an overreaching, all-encompassing presence of God. And then there's that very, uh, very personal presence of God in each believer's life and corporately in the church. We celebrate that. We value that. And it is to that presence, that person, that reality that we flee in times of trust and refuge. And it's not just that we come and go. It's where we choose to abide. Well, in verse 6, um, it says the Lord examines the righteous. Now, this is, not, this is a little different than observing us, as was mentioned in the earlier verse. But... He examines the righteous. So this is talking about trying us or testing us, not punishing us, not trying to uh, hurt us in, in any way. But it's a process that reveals how close we are to him. And when the trials and pressures of life come and we find ourselves fleeing from him, uh, then it's a test that we need to understand. And need to understand our tendency to do that, to abandon our trust in him. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a time to flee. 
that there isn't a time whenever we need to take steps because of what's happening in the world around us. In the book of Peter in the New Testament, he writes it to the diaspora, which means the scattered. And because of the persecution that was coming against the church, it was expedient that people s- separate themselves from where they were living and find other places in the empire, the Roman Empire, to live for safety's sake. So this wasn't abandoning faith and trust in God. Quite to the contrary, it was a strength that led them to take proper measures to avoid the persecution that they were experiencing. And so uh, there are times that we just have to say no to things, that we have to say no to the realities that are around us in terms of the practices of people or the kinds of things that persecute the, the very nature of God's work in the earth. And that's, of course, this is church. To persecute or to practice things that are opposite to what is his holiness and what is his kingdom, the way to live and the power to live a good life. He goes on to say, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. So when it comes to the righteous, that he tries, his presence and his power is with them, and and he provides the protection we, we need. But when it comes to those who choose not to believe in God and practice right, uh, unrighteousness or wickedness, he abandons them to their own devices. It doesn't mean he doesn't love them. The Bible says that he, God loved the whole world that he gave his son. But he hates the practice. He hates what it represents. And his, and his hatred is more of a lamentation of the separation that exists between himself and those who've chosen to go their own way. Verse 6. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. Um, When it comes to the consequences of sin and evil, they are great indeed. And the the price that a person pays from uh, choosing to live a life apart from God is is, is really of eternal consequence. Uh, Avoiding his presence it is a very serious thing to do. Um, I urge you to read Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the last two books, the uh, last two chapters of the last book of the Bible, to see how just how serious this is. Verse 7, the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. The Lord is righteous. He loves justice. So much injustice in this world. And so much cries against it. And so many people rising up and say that we have to change things. And that's all good. But the, the, the true strength of justice and righteousness, as good as human efforts can be and are, in fact, good, and produce good things, it it falls short of the kind of justice that flows and the righteousness that flows from the throne, from the presence of God. And notice it says, the upright will see his face. Uh, This is taking us into a different dimension. The scripture says nobody can see God and live. just, Just our own humanness and fallenness and to come into the whole pure holy presence of God in the absolute sense uh, would kill us. That's what the scripture says. But here it says, the upright will see his face. So he's talking about, well, yes, we see his face now in, in, a, in, a, in measure. There are things all around us, even in nature, where we see the hand of God. And, and we see his power and his presence and his person. And uh, we love him and we rejoice in, uh, in his presence. But then there's this absolute state of presence where we will see his face, that we will be in a state of existence ourselves that will enable us to look at him without being overcome by that experience. And of course, that's 
going to happen when Jesus comes back, at the return of Christ. When the, when the time comes for the body of Christ, the church, to actually be in his personal, real presence, physically. Uh, wow. There's no adversity on this world that can keep us from that. And every adversity that we face, the Lord's presence sustains us. The Lord delivers us from the enemies that will attack us as we see what he's done and what he's doing and the voices that say, fly to the mountain. And the attacks that come from that place as the first verse uh, referred to, the, just those unexpected attacks from people that are against us. Um, well, he delivers us from our enemies. And, and he, those who choose to be in close communion with God, uh, he touches us. There's, a, there's this presence. There's this, I don't know, you can't explain it uh, except to say once you've experienced it, you'll never be the same. And the Lord is moving us today towards a world that is to come. Not, yes, we need to be responsible for our world today and do our very best to influence it and to help in terms of this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Uh, yes, we need to, to be on the front lines to, to care and to love and to pray. But there is a reality that's greater. And he's moving us toward that. We're responsible while we're here for what's here. At the same time, this is not the end of the story. The Lord is righteous and he loves justice. I, I'm going to read you uh, just a brief passage from uh, the account of uh, a funeral that was like no other funerals. It happened on June the 26th, 1949, in the city of Tel Aviv in Israel. And uh, I don't think the world has ever, well, I'm sure it hasn't seen a funeral like this before or since. And it says this, the newspapers reported that there were tens of thousands of people present and around, and around the great synagogue on that day in Tel Aviv. In the main half of the synagogue, a glass box that was five feet long held 30 porcelain urns. The newspapers reported that inside these 30 urns were the ashes of an estimated 200,000 Jews who had been murdered in the Holocaust. The box was loaded onto a police vehicle that would travel through the city streets. The pace was very slow because it had to make its way through the thousands of mourners who cried out, Mama, Papa, as the pro procession made its way to the cemetery. Some were so overcome by grief and horrific memories of what, uh, of what had happened that they fainted. The, the procession wound its way through Jerusalem until it came to the ancient cemetery of Sanhedria, where some of the graves were 2,000 years old. The man who was responsible for this event was Simon Weisenthal. In 1949, he was 41 years old, and he would be a man who would never forget the atrocities of the Holocaust, nor would he let the world forget. But there was a huge challenge he faced in all of it. Many of the Holocaust survivors and those who were related to them wanted the whole matter to be shrouded in silence because of the anxiety, the embarrassment, and the guilt that they shared because of their involvement in it. But for Weisenthal, the event was very emotional. In fact, he wrote, as I followed the box of ashes, I remembered my family members, my friends and companions, and all those who paid with their lives for the one single sin, being born Jewish. I looked at the box and I saw my mother's face, 
the way it looked the last time I saw her on that fateful day when I left home in the morning, uh, in the morning for forced labor outside the ghetto, and I did not know that I would not see her when I returned in the evening, nor ever again. And he would lose, it says, a total of 69 or 89 relatives in the Holocaust. Can you imagine an evil perpetrated on the earth that is, was so horrific as that? And this was not something like a pandemic that is not born by, it's, it's a virus. It's not something that humans are doing. This is something that stemmed from the heart of evil men. And it shows just how the degree to which evil, when it's practiced, as it was in the Holocaust, just how devastating it can be. Imagine tens of thousands of people and just just might have been a sprinkle of their relative. But in in those urns, in that casket, was their loved ones, their mother, father, husband, wife, children, parents, relatives, friends. And the cry as it went down the street and as they imagined what it would have been like for them to suffer and die the way they did. And he cried out for justice. He, he gave the rest of his life to bringing war criminals to justice. And the Bible says that God loves justice. He loves it. Well, is justice, side of, is justice satisfied in the courts of men? In human courts? Well, maybe to a degree. But the ultimate justice, the ultimate deliverance from the things that cause justice, the evil and the sin of, of sin in the world, is, doesn't come from a political system or a judicial system. It's not from the courts or the police. It comes from the time we will stand before God. And give an account for the things that we've done. It's in that day that true justice will be exacted. And what is your plea going to be in that day? What will the righteous do? Will they say, will they say, God, I, I, you know, I did this and I did that and that was bad, but I did this and this and this and it was better. So I think I've got more good than I do bad. Is that okay? Well, when, if we think that way, we don't understand the consequences of the smallest sin and how it violates the holiness and the justice and the righteousness of God. So how do we face that day? As much as we, we honor what Weisenthal did in his efforts to bring justice to this world because of the atrocities of World War II, uh, for the courts of God, it takes more than that. And thankfully, more than that happened. There was a day, a little over 2,000 years ago, when all of the injustices and sin and evil was placed upon one man. And that man was Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the anointed of God, to take on the sins of the world And in so doing, in his righteous capacity, he satisfied all the demands of God's holiness and justice. And is able, because he took our place, he took our punishment, the sins of the world were placed upon him. He suffered on our behalf. He, He bore the crimes of all the world, yes, even of the Holocaust. And made possible freedom, justice, and righteousness. And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that because of what Jesus has done for us, God can be just. In other words, not violate who he is as a holy God who who sits on his holy throne, his righteous throne. He's not violating that holiness or his person by pardoning us, by giving us salvation, setting us free from all that we've done and from all we've inherited through Adam's race. (laughs) And declare us to be righteous. 
Justification is a judicial term, and it's found throughout the New Testament. He has justified us freely, without, without any thought of maybe this is not a good idea, but freely by his grace and by his love that was manifested when Jesus died on the cross on our behalf. Well, we have a prayer line that you can call, and uh, it's going to appear on the screen here. Um, and I'm going to encourage you to call. Uh, we, we, uh, we've had some interesting calls. Um, one from a person in Ottawa, one from in, uh, Ohio, and the most recent one from Georgia. How they ever found out about us, we don't know. But they found our prayer line somehow and, uh, and called. We don't ask for anybody's name if they want to give it to us. Um, they can. We don't ask for uh, your phone number or anything like that. Uh, it can be a private, confidential thing, or you can uh, can give it to us, and we will certainly keep you mind in mind, and we'll we'll respond to you if you wish. Uh, but the prayer line is for everybody, and it's confidential, and you're welcome to call. You can call if you've been struggling with this matter of faith in God, or particularly faith in Jesus with the offer of salvation that he gives to us. And you can call about that and talk to the person on the line and, and, uh, and let them uh, talk to you. Uh, one person a little while ago said, I, I, I just need to understand how I can become a Christian. And we thank God for that person. And we pray for them. Well, um, it might be a different need. Maybe you're stressed out about something or you're, there's a physical need. You could call the prayer line and, uh, and receive prayer. But right here, right now, in this moment, I'm going to pray and ask you to uh, join with me in your heart, wherever you are, and uh, allow the presence of God, that wonderful presence that we talked about, uh, that personal sense of him coming to where you are right where right now right here and uh, to receive help and may he become today your refuge your source of strength i pray that in jesus name let us pray lord we thank you today for your word we thank you for what we learned from this experience in david's life and he wrote this to the chief musician. This was supposed to be celebratory. This was supposed to be something set to music. This whole psalm was about rejoicing in who you are and what you've done and the refuge that you are to us. We can trust you safely and know that you see us, you observe us, and you help us. Lord God, I pray for every listener today. Bless them. Bless those who are struggling with this whole pandemic thing that's happening. Uh, bless those who are struggling with health issues or, or other issues, whatever they are. Uh, maybe they're suffering from an addiction, a place that they flee to as their mountain uh, in order to find some solace or comfort or, or, or just to avoid the reality uh, that assails them, that's unpleasant, undesirable. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone listening. And I thank you for the opportunity to put our trust in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you for joining me this morning.